know, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. So we'll talk to you today about um, our latest uh, intergenerational program called uh, Resident-Led Initiative, which falls under the Promote Resident Empowerment uh, aspirational statement. So what's the agenda for today? Um, we'll talk to you about why are we here? How do we get started? We'll touch on resident empowerment. We'll uh, review the different intergenerational uh, programs that have taken place at the Village of Erin Meadows throughout the years. Uh, David will talk about uh, the details of um, some of the programs and his personal involvement and experiences with, um, with um, being the facilitator. Uh, we actually have a, a proposal for a new program that all of you can uh, implement uh, in your own homes if you wish to do so. And finally, we'll have the, the top three recommendations. So why are we here? So the resident-led initiative, um, intergenerational program, uh, it's basically a collaboration between our village and um, the neighboring high school. And um, it engages residents in the development and the delivery of a health and wellness course um, for the students taking that course. And um, it basically uh, provides an opportunity for the students to come to our village and become part of our community. I won't go into the details now. Everyone has a handout of the, um, the highlights, the most important points, I guess, about this program in your folders. Uh, it talks about you know, why is this important, who is all involved, how to get started if you wish to do so, resources. Um, and David will discuss the details later on. But I'll tell you how we got started. And um, for those that are part of Schlegel Villages, uh, you know that we started back in 2009 when we made the decision to, to join the, the journey of changing the culture of aging. And uh, in the fall of uh, 2010, which is you know, the following year, we developed uh, the eight aspirational statements. And you see them on the right. Um, the photo is courtesy of uh, Lisa from ThinkLink Graphics. I get that right, Josie? Okay. And uh, promote resident empowerment is uh, one of those aspirations. So what is resident empowerment? So we believe that empowerment is a fundamental human right. And uh, we promote uh, resident empowerment not only by education, but by supporting our residents to find and fulfill their life purpose. And um, we see the residents as the leaders. And you can see empowered Mr. Kent to the right there doing his thing. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, doing his thing, which is storytelling. And um, you probably know this if you read the handout that was emailed to all of us. But according to Bill Thomas, uh, one of the pioneer, pioneers in, uh, in the culture change movement, uh, storytelling ability is the most important skill or competency needed to drive change in um, culture, uh, to drive culture change in senior living communities. So I'll hand it over to, to Sammy to review the different intergenerational programs that have taken place at Erin Meadows, uh, and then over to David. The first intergenerational project that we had is, it was in 2009, we had Wisdom Project with Stephen Lewis Secondary School with the goal to encourage compassion, respect, and understanding between generations and across ethnic and religious lines so students and the elderly alike can recognize their common humanity. Twelve students, we paired them up with six residents for six weeks to meet two hours for each session. At week seven, students, they presented our residents to us in so many different creative way, like uh, poems you know, and uh, uh, even you know short films. And it was such a great success on that time that it was featured in Long Term Care magazine and uh, Miss Saga News. Next. 2014, we had sharing a smiles with the same school with the goal to develop interaction amongst teens and the elderly and promote a compassionate, respectful society. Again, 12 students, six residents, great success. Then 2015, this time with Young Social Inventor, Inventors uh, Program project, we had David Kent as one of those six residents. 
as David moved to Erin Meadows on August 6, 2014. So during that project, we realized that how great potential of being a teacher a, 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 a leader and a facilitator is in that gentleman. So again, a great success. And for the project after that, which was Project BAN, Bridge Ageism Now, with the goal to develop positive relationship with the two generations and engage a student actively in long-term care day-to-day -day life, I asked David, David, this is the goal. We're, we're going to start a new project, but I don't think you should be one of the six residents this time. He said, OK, that's fine. That's fine, Sammy. I understand. I said, you know what? We really believe that you have to be the facilitator this time. <laughs> so David selected the residents. David interviewed the students, paired them up with the residents. David planned a wonderful three-hour orientation for the students and their two teachers. We had to see the teachers sitting in that orientation like, you know, they were much more <laughs> curious than the students to learn about long-term care. And this time, the project, it was that great success. That the next step was the principal invited David and I to the school to talk to us and give us a new proposal. I let David Kent to say the rest of the story. The picture you saw there of me with the dark glasses. <laughs> okay, this goes back to the Pioneer Network 2015. I was a presenter and uh, we arrived in a Schlegel bus, which is a fantastic bus, got all kinds of logos on the side. And we arrived at the uh, hotel Hyatt Regency. At, we were late. And so uh, all the attendees there, the guys that uh, load the, the, uh, the vans and the concierge, they, they wonder what's going on here, there's this bus. So about six or seven are looking at the bus, wondering what it is. And uh, out of the, of the car, of the, tr of the van, comes uh, two very pretty ladies. One is a bus driver and one is the, uh, the GM. And so out they come, and these guys now are pretty interested now. And they come out <laughs> and uh, they come up uh, very, very calm, very, very relaxed, and put the ramp down. I'm inside with the, with the third pretty lady. <laughs> and so when the ramp comes out, I come out wearing the dark glasses, <laughs> looking like a white Ray Charles. <laughs> ramp comes down, girls open up the door, I march in. Here comes the king. <laughs> Anyway, that's, that's, what, that's what that story is about. <laughs> and to roll it back, yeah, to roll it back, I wanted to just take a quick uh, time capsule with me coming into this home, Village of Aaron Mills. It's the last place on earth I ever wanted to be in. We tried to, I have a disease called inclusion body myositis. It's a muscle wasting disease. I've had it for 40, 42 years. I taught high school for, for uh, 35 years, and I had the disease for 25 of those years. I uh, was a head of phys ed, ran athletics, coached multiple teams, uh, taught history, taught adult education, worked at, at uh, sports camps, etc. And so I was an active person, and we tried to fight this disease ourselves, my wife and I, and with the help of Red Cross people, and nurses for a year and a half. We couldn't do it. It was getting worse. Uh, I had to go to the hospital uh, 12 days there. They couldn't fix up what was wrong. So they told me, here's your choice. You can't go at home. You're going to have to go long-term care. So August the 6th, we came into a, to a, a place that I knew nothing about. It looked nice because they had the, all the village stuff, the main street. So my wife said, oh, isn't that nice? It, got a main, it looks like a main street. And I was 15 minutes away from where we live. That's the only reason why, why we went in there. And when I came in, the shock was immense. Any resident that goes into a long-term care home is scared. If they say they're not, they're not telling you the truth. It's a scary thing. You're going away from all what you know. 
you're going into something that's unknown. Uh, there's a new schedule, get up at six. I never got up at six in my life uh, for a shower, which was a killer. And all these different things you had to do. I didn't leave my room for three weeks, except for meals. And uh, I said to my wife, I don't know how I'm gonna, I don't know how I'm gonna make it here. It's a house, there's no way it's a home. And I just don't know how I'm gonna survive with, with, with my surroundings. Then I got better. Then I felt better. And after three weeks, I felt like, it's, I, felt like I wanted to go, come out. And I felt better because of the PSWs. They are something else. And they got me better. And the nurses were good. I got the 24-7 the treatment. And I felt better, and I started gaining weight. And just to bring you up to now, to, to give you an idea of what's, uh, what's transpired, I have gained 27 pounds. I came in at 133. I now weigh 160, mostly muscle. <laughs> it's, this, no, this, this disease was supposed to be incurable. This disease, nobody gains muscle. This disease, after 42 years, I'm, I'm having the longest in this country, I'm better. This disease is in full remission. And I owe it to culture change. I owe it to the Village Air and Meadows. I owe it to the PSWs and nurses. That's when my life changed, coming out of that room. And I, first thing I wanted to do was I wanted to uh, see if I could get involved in teaching of some sort. And uh, because they, 2009, they had changed their, their viewpoint of culture change from the Pioneer Network, they allowed me to do that. And that's what culture change is for a resident. You give us the opportunity to do something we've done before, I taught before. So what did I do there? I hooked up with another ex-teacher, Larissa, who's a recreational uh, therapist. We teach other residents. What do we teach them? I, we teach them history, Canadian history, ancient history, sport, art, nature. The two of us have taught 60 seminars since we've been in there. Two years, 60 seminars. 20 to 25 residents are the ones in our, in, in our class, and five are over 95. It's an amazing group. I'm gonna, t I'm gonna show you later on a picture of three of my students. Everybody passes, nobody fails. <laughs> That's the good part. That's the good part. <laughs> and uh, the one gal who's 99, gonna be 100, December 20th, sits right at the front of the class, teacher's pet, right here. <laughs> and can't, she has hearing problems, she has, she has eyesight problems, and uh, she keeps calling me Mr. Kent. So I said, Marie, look, I'm a, I'm a resident with you. I want, I'm like a neighbor. Don't call me Mr. Kent. Call me David. Yes, sir. <laughs> <laughs> you can't change habits. You can't change habits. <laughs> so I came out, I started to teach. I felt, I felt better. I started to get involved uh, more. And they, they gave me the opportunities to do this. And uh, the next thing I did was resident council. I went to some meetings, liked it, uh, became president of the resident council, and since then I'm now on the board of directors of the OARC, the Ontario group, so I'm seeing the full picture now, which is great. And then uh, I became uh, co-chair with, with Sammy, and uh, we could boss this guy around because we're co-chairs. <laughs> co-chair of the uh, VAT Village Advisory Team. And so as a co-chair, we have a cross-section of all of the village. And I made sure two of my PSWs got on there, which they are. And we have the nurses, we have the uh, dietitian, we have family, family council on, which is what it should be. Resident council should be with family council. So that, that's, that's the team. Then came facilitating. And the facilitating started, there's the one of, okay. These are two of the uh, young ladies I had when I was, uh, uh, a resident, they came back last uh, spring to, uh, actually the one on, on you see on the left, Rafia. Rafia 
uh, when I had, was with her two years ago, shy, inverted, uh, no self-confidence, wanted to join something to see if she would improve herself. And uh, the next year, 2016, where this, where this picture's from, she ran the show. What a switch. She was, uh, wants to be a lawyer, no longer, she wants to be in the health science field. And the other young, young, pretty young lady beside her, Rabia, was uh, also really, uh, we, we bonded, the three of us. And Rabia came back to say hello for, for this uh, celebration in June. And Rabia, she's at university, but she makes sure now she volunteers. That's what the power of this was, the, the band project. You get your one-on-one, -on -one. It, was, it was two kids, or students, I should say, for one resident. And we made sure the residents, when I picked the residents, I had three from cognitive, I had three from less cognitive areas. One from lockdown. Secure. It, it was, or, sorry, secure. It, it was, <laughs> it, it, it's, it was the, it was the, the uh, uh, time of their lives. Time of their lives with, with, with these people. And uh, it was magical. So we had that. And then the, the next one is the Schism program. And this, this is extracurricular with this, uh, with the first one, BAN. But the, the SHISM is a program that the Ministry of Education has in the high schools now, especially high-skilled major. And this one was health and well-being. They got one in art, they got one in music, and the school has to be a special school to get this. You apply. Not all schools get it. And so we really were lucky because the school that we were involved with with BAN was the same school for, for SHISM. And uh, so, as Sammy said, they wanted to, to connect with us again. 30 students, and we, uh, I set up an orientation for them. And uh, in they came with the two teachers. 26 girls to four guys. That's about the ratio. As you know, in the homes, like four to one, five to one. We have no, we have no chance. <laughs> and the, uh, so in, come, in came the 30 people. Uh, the students, and we wanted to make sure that uh, Sammy welcomed them. We wanted to make sure they heard a story. And they heard my story, about 20 minutes. The volunteers had, had their part. And then we had uh, a dementia session. And then we had a tour for them. And the tour has to show the whole place. We want to see the lock, the, the, sorry, the secure area. And they saw this and were blown away with what they saw. They were, uh, they were, uh, and when we asked them after it was over, what, was, what they felt from this, they said the biggest surprise for them coming in, it wasn't a hospital. It wasn't, everyone wasn't in beds. People were alive, people were doing things, people were smiling. That's the stigma, and that's what we have to change. We gotta change the stigma to get, to get the culture, culture change idea through to them. So, okay, next, after the schism, uh, there's, there's excitement, just, just roll it back a minute. Here, here's the kids, Congo line, two guys with four 85-year-old ladies. Okay, what, what we got next? That's the, okay, the new program, Meet the Elders. This one, which any high school can do, any long-term care can do, because what you want, you have the resource here of the wisdom of the elders. You've, it's loaded with people with fantastic careers. So invite the schools in. We're gonna invite the Stephen Lewis in uh, uh, next time. Invite them in, negotiate with them, have the president of resident council there for sure, rec person there for sure, GM, and have them, I want the student council in and the athletic department. Here are the leaders of your high schools. They'll go back, they'll network, they'll respect it and have them come in for two hours, orientation session, and at that time, make sure you have storytellers. That's it. Okay, on, that's my, who are my students. On the left is Pauline, 99, a farm lady, Ukrainian, uh, one of seven kids, uh, is, uh, broke her hip twice, broke her leg, still is a whirlwind in the place. Middleman, Muhammad, 92, uh, has gone through two revolutions, Pakistan and, and, uh, and uh, India, 
He was bombed in Calcutta. Uh, he was uh, involved in the war with Iraq and Iran and was bombed in Tehran. The story he has are unbelievable. And the last one, Marie is going to be 100 December the 22nd. And one of 14 kids, the youngest of 14 kids, uh, at, this is the Depression years. Things were really tough in the Depression years. So what she did was she went to grade 12. At the age of 12, her uh, second eldest brother, uh, wife had died. The five kids came to live with, with the mother and, and, uh, and her. The mother died after two years. At 14, she brought up five kids at 14. And so when she was 28, she got married, came back to Toronto, to cut the long story short. And here's the thing for the December 22nd party. Her two sons are coming, 66 and 68. And the nephew, the second youngest nephew, at 88, is coming to see his surrogate mother. <laughs> Unbelievable, right? So that's, that's, the, that's, the, that, that's the, the stories that can be told. I've just told three quick ones. The kids are hooked on this. They fall in love with the place after 10 minutes. Believe me, they will. And the last one, what's the power of storytelling? Everybody's inspired. It empowers everybody. And to show the kids, live every day of your life. Make the most of it. Thank you. That was incredible. Got the recommendation. Thank you very much, David, Dennis, and Sammy, for sharing. Um, I, I don't know about any of you, but I had a, a nice big lump in my throat, David, when you were speaking about your experiences. So thank you for sharing so openly and honestly. I think it taught us all. Uh, just one more thing on this journey of culture change. So thank you for that. Do, uh, does anybody have any questions um, or a comment or anything? We do, do have a, a quick minute um, before we, we do need to introduce the, the next speakers. But if just wanted to open up for anybody. Oh, anybody from? Oh, excellent. Thanks. Thanks. I have a question to the staff members who've been there from 2009. And maybe, David, you can comment from your more recent experience. In the work that Schlegel Villages has done, you've identified language, the previous institutional language, and now language that shifts a whole series of words to a new place. How important do you believe the shift in language has been to your staff and to actually creating a uh, an environment that is conducive to resident empowerment who actually don't come from the institutional healthcare world that those old words come from. <laughs> sure, so it's, it's one of the many factors I think that you know are very important in the culture change movement. I mean uh, I don't want to say like maybe the one the top ten because it's not only the team members but even family members, visitors, other stakeholders are witnessing that and you know basically they, they they see that we use it day in and day out so they change their perspectives so it's very important for the team members definitely so yeah it, it has definitely evolved over the last six or seven years I don't know if you want to comment David about the last couple of years and the language particularly yeah no they're careful with the language but what I do as a teacher I correct their English <laughs> I do. They all, they all know, they come in and, and they say, how are you? I say, very well, thank you. And, they, and I hear them come down the hall, but don't say good, say very well. <laughs> We have, um, we have a question from online, uh, from Marcia. Good fellow, is this a course the youth gets credit for? Is it done during school hours? Uh, uh, the, the, uh, it's uh, exponential learning. You mean the, the SHISM program? Yes. yes. Yeah, it's exponential learning. Uh, they don't get credit for that. It's a two-year course, and they, there's a co-op part of that of this of this uh, two-year course for senior students. They get credits for the co-op part of it. Yeah. Yeah. That's great. Thank you so much. Okay. Well, big round of applause to thank you so much. Excellent.